Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just opening up the waiting room and letting everyone either turn their cameras on, but keeping their microphones muted. Um, I'm sure our readers would love to see faces. Um, if you want to give a little wave and hello, I also invite you to use the chat if you want to share um, where you are currently located, where you are zooming in from. Um, it's always fun to know where the audience is based. Uh, my name is Naya Bricker. I'm the Administrative Director at the Fine Arts Work Center. We've got some people waving and typing in where they're calling from. Awesome. Uh, I am just letting a few more people in. And I will be here throughout the call in the background. Um, just tending to any Zoom logistics, um, send me a chat if you're having trouble hearing. Um, I'm gonna be keeping an eye on my inbox if you are disconnected from the call or if you know someone else that um, you want to send the link to. Um, oh, we got so many, so many good things from the chat coming in. New Jersey Shore area, Denver, Colorado, Cleveland. We have Paris. We do, we've got someone else that's in Europe on the call. Very exciting. Austin, Texas, Brooklyn, Woodstock, Vermont, Somerville, Mass. We've got the whole country. This is great. Well, I am going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Jennifer Jean, um, our 24 Pearl Street Program Director. Uh, program manager extraordinaire and our MC for this evening. I'm so happy to have her here. I'm going to spotlight her on the screen um, and then we'll get into the reading. Hi everybody. It's so good to see all of you and I mean by like actually seeing everybody's face. If you're not shy, as Naya said, please feel free to un- uh, uncamera yourself. No, that's not right. You know, make yourself seen by video um, because it's great to connect to each other's uh, faces as much as possible. Um, so yeah, hi, welcome to Wilder Words. Uh, the, I'm the um, program director of 24 Pearl Street, as Naya said. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jean, and I've been hosting this series uh, since I joined uh, Fine Arts Work Center, which is just about a year ago this month, I think, or maybe next month, so it hasn't been too long. Um, whenever I've run the series, I've uh, just, it just brings me so much joy um, to, to continue the sense of community that the Fine Arts Work Center is known for through this, um, this event, this sort of virtual event, uh, just is so great. So Fine Arts Work Center misses you all, as I know all of you miss the, the center. And we have a lot of work, things in, in store for you. Um, we have a new look on our campus. So if you're thinking about coming in the summer, we are planning on opening uh, to welcome everybody. Um, and we have just rebuilt so many things. Um, we also are rebuilding things online too. We have a new uh, platform for 24 Pearl Street. If you haven't taken a class there, please definitely take one. <laughs> um, all the readers tonight are uh, 24 Pearl Street teachers for the winter session and uh, their, all their classes are open for you to register even now. Um, and we will be using that new platform as well. Our website is going to be getting refurbished soon. And um, one exciting thing that you should know about on the website is in the early parts of February, we'll be launching that summer program catalog. And so everybody keeps emailing me and, and my colleagues, Naya and uh, summer program director, Sarah Siegel about you know what's in store for summer. You're going to find out very soon. And I know I keep using and overusing the word exciting, uh, but it is, it's so exciting. Um, we have returning faculty, new faculty, uh, different, all different kinds of programs, some hybrid programs that are going to happen too. So it's awesome. Um, as I said, there's still time to register. You can go to foc.org backslash 24. And you can see the, the uh, winter catalog there. Uh, I wanna highlight two programs besides the programs that the readers are gonna be teaching. 
Um, we have a new style of programming. It's a generative poetry workshop called a Saturday Sprint. It lasts three hours. And uh, last session in the fall, we had an Amy Nezakumatato. She taught one of these three-hour Saturday Sprints. And upcoming in the winter, we have Brian Turner and um, teaching one, as well as Dorian Lux teaching another. So go online, catalog, look it up, sign up. It's going to be fun. They're psyched about doing these workshops. Um, all right, so what other business do we have here? Well, um, you should know in the chat, uh, they will be posted as the readers are reading, either just before or just after they're reading. We're gonna post links to their books. Um, definitely support them. They're all fabulous writers uh, and check out their, their books in those links. And we're providing links from East End Books in Provincetown we wanna support. Uh, the local indie bookstores that are close to our campus and East End Books is, is a great place to shop. So when you're there in Provincetown, shop there, but also support them online and as well support all our readers by purchasing their books. Uh, yeah, so keep yourself muted while, while the reading's going. I think by now everybody knows the Zoom etiquette. Um, you all know. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's, let's get started. We're going to uh, I'm, going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to introduce each reader. They're going to read in alphabetical order. And we're going to start off with Curtis Bauer, who is the author of three poetry collections, most recently American Selfie, uh, which is forthcoming in a Spanish translation uh, very soon. And his forthcoming translations include the novel The Home Reading Service by uh, Fabio Marbrito, uh, and the memoir Land of Women by Maria Sanchez. Curtis teaches creative writing and comparative literature at Texas Tech University. And today he joins us from Spain. So welcome, Curtis Bauer. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. And I, I'm thrilled to be reading with all of you. So um, the theme tonight is beginning, so I'm gonna, I'm going to start off with a with a poem by someone else. Uh, her name's Maria Gomez Lara. She's a Colombian poet, and this is a poem that really uh, kind of made me want to. You know, usually this is what happens when I when I start translating work. I read something that just makes me want to translate it, and this was that first poem of hers that I read. So this is my translation. I'm not going to read the the Spanish, but this is from her book. Uh, the Place of Words, with, begins with an epigraph by Rose Auslander. Number words, time words, skin words. And the title of the poem is Skin Words. If I could pick another skin, it would be dark like mine, and it would be made of words. If I could say skin words, in that way have a body like mine, but eloquent when being broken. If I had a body that said, for example, here I am, I haven't left, for example, I survive. A body that would give reasons and whys and not this bewilderment, this weariness, these bones almost dust from so much breaking. How much you'd understand then if I had words instead of scars. And this next poem is from a book that's um, coming out in March. Uh, by It's another translation from the Spanish by the Argentine poet Clara Muchetti. And the, the, the book is going to be out with Eulalia books. It's called This Could Take Some Time. And this is actually the first poem in the, in the book. And it's something that I, I just sent my edits kind of final edits to the editors today with, with a little tweak here that I'm trying out on all of you. Um, we'll see if, how it sounds, mainly. I'll see how it sounds, really. <clears throat> I can't stop thinking about the animals wailing. It leaks in from some nearby apartment. I look at the monitor, keep clicking through the images, which are practically the same, the face of an older woman. The only difference is an almost indiscernible frown. The animal's wailing is louder. I peer into the building's pulmon, its lung, which is its inner courtyard, and I can't see anything. The wailing is sharp. 
I go back to my chair and look at her face. I go through the pictures again, and I'm not sure if it's better that she hardly smiles. I stand up, stretch, and the animal's wailing sets the pace. I look at her face from where I am. How strange. From a distance, it changes. Her gaze seems menacing. I go back to my chair. I lost track of day number seven of month number six. I didn't have lunch and now it's too late to have it. I'll have to accept that this day will have one less meal and an outside factor jammed in the middle. I go back to the building's lung, peer into it. The breeze confuses me. I'm not even sure where the whale is coming from. Someone shouts to shut the animal up. The animal stops crying for a few seconds, then howls even harder. The phone rings. I answer it. My mother asks how I am and is horrified by the wailing. She suggests that we talk later, hangs up, but first says, poor animal, and something about the world. I close my eyes and the woman's face appears intact in my memory. That's it. It's already part of what I'm going to remember. I sit at the edge of the lung. I join the animal. I think it might be trapped in physical pain or simply alone. The phone rings again, but I don't answer it. I go to the kitchen, turn on the stove. I look at the flame. The animal stops crying suddenly. I turn it off and I regret it. Bring the glow, bring it now. The hours go by and sometimes it's hard to get organized. I'm going to read a few, a few of um, a few of my poems. Um, one from the most recent book, American Selfie, uh, the beginning of the book. <laughs> I'll keep repeating that. Maybe everyone's going to say it tonight. But then the others are are all new poems. Um, so this is this is the poem Euphoric. Maybe I should praise the mapped green vast where the road I follow disappears and the GPS triangle that is me begins to twirl as if I'm not the only one confused, but then follows me into the expanse in front of the car, in front of the declining sun that in four hours more or less will glint the humping pump jack some oil shade of rusted. And I hope to be gone by then, to have found some paved road I've never reached down to touch, but will to thank it and whisper, thank you, like some hostage newly freed, and return to her country, kissing the tarmac in front of cameras before the neck of her wife or cheek of her father, or saluted some officer obliged to welcome her home. Or I would better show my gratitude today by pulling down the six coyote carcasses lining the property fence I shouldn't have entered, thinking it was a new way home, past the gravel pit where kids from Rawls must come to drink and fuck, maybe their older cousins to escape their marriages, or to shoot cans out of the sky, and someone got so pissed drunk he took off that pair of green denim jeans, perfect on the rack at Sears, and less so each minute out here, on a road without a name, a path really, and left them crumpled on the crumpled dirt, the only green in this sea, this sea of red earth. A few still think what they do is farm and therefore spend their money and hours disking back and forth across the fields like boats trawling the Salton Sea, or an astronaut on Mars who lost a special tool in what wouldn't be called a field, but something else, interstellar and spatial like Terra Vasta. And this is Texas, so that might work because the ground is vast and about to blow around your face. And I haven't killed anything with four legs and fur in years. Though last night I misstepped again and my friend the salamander, salamander who clung to the wall near the kitchen and watched me pass every day since July, jumped beneath a shoe and stayed kissing the floor as if euphoric having finally been released from the wall. And I buried him in the trash heap I call compost. And I should drive back east to find those carcasses now bristling in the evening wind and help them back to that euphoric ground which adored them and kissed each of their trotting feet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
this next poem is a is going to go or it's part of a new a new collection that I'm working on and um, what to say about it I, I think you know thinking about that I mean I, I'm taking this beginning theme to heart in that uh, this is one of the poems that is helping me figure out a direction and something I, I think a lot about are distractions how when I'm writing when I'm in my day, I get distracted a lot and I kind of go off on these little tangents. And when I'm, so when I started this new project, I started identifying those distractions. And so they're in here and I've marked them and I'll, I'll set them aside for you as I, as I read them. Um, so this is called With Figs and Dust and Distractions. <clears throat> Excuse me. with figs and dust and distractions. I didn't wake up thinking about the fig tree in Jardines, but I am now in the preposition over instead of on, for the fig spans the hillside. At least I remember it that way now, 6 a.m., a week after the walk up the hill to another abandoned factory in this city of abandoned factories, and I've thought twice about a catalog of all the figs I want to eat where I'll look for them at the end of September when they'll ripen the air with a smell that means they're close to rotting. So better load up my hands, fold my shirt into a kind of bucket when there are no buckets near, and even drop some on the ground for Ibai, who loves them. I'll bet my right hand as much as our friend Sizzle, who sings praise to figs across the ocean just down the road that separates us. Distraction. I want to swim in smell bathed like swimming used to be, or sunbathing, which means sprawl out and let it soak in. To be soaked in fig, to be soaked in anything. I was soaked in dust for years. Imagine sweat, summer, grain bin heat and scooping corn until the central auger stops and someone palm punches the corrugated wall, which means come out in Eastern Iowan and rest. Imagine sweat, wet shirt and arms, face, neck, pants cr crinkled dry in a 40-foot breeze when you climb out of a roof hole. Dust, dry like dirt, sweat mix soaked into a slurry I still think seeps out of me on humid days. 35. I did the math. 51 minus 16 equals 35 years later, and I still twitch. I'm changed. I see my distractions. Dust changed me. Some never smoked pot or dropped acid in the 70s and 80s. I never ate a fig and thought a mandarin orange came in cans. I've heard of citrus but never saw their trees. Florida, California, myths, escapes, vacations, distraction, dust. I don't mind it on the surface here. My mother had a dust cloth. I never saw it cleaned, but cleaning. It held the scent of pledge in a kind of permanent damp, like sweat. It held all the dust in our house for 20 years. I think it could have sunk the farm. Something did, or buckle the floor joists into the foundations, into the ground. I touch it when I can. I never thought I'd take or could. I'm going to read um, just a couple more. This is <coughs> called Open Yard with Bird Approaching. She said I'd think she was crazy, my wife, who tried to save a life for building a bed inside a box, placing a few sunflower kernels for a robin that looked like death, had already taken up residence inside after it, the bird, not death, 
Flew at our window's reflection of open yard with bird approaching and she, this Basque woman I love, also my wife, showed me how she'd spent her hour I was away, pointing with a blue gloved finger she'd touched the breast for signs of life, then stroked and sang the same calming sounds we hummed our dog when she nearly died failing to fly off a fourth story roof one summer at the box on our table our Basque shepherd sat in front of vigilant for movement for something miraculous which for her can be a butterfly or wind-blown plastic cup rattled on asphalt too but then a kind of surprise sound squealed out of her wife's not dogs not just mouth, but body as it, the sound, not dog or monarch or cup, moved into astonishment. And when it, the robin, thought dead, looked up at us from its new home made of cardboard, then jumped and flew slow undulations to the fence top and looked back at us, ducked its head as if gesturing in some dialect of robin speech, I wish I could better read her gratitude. Then stared at us, this speaker, two Basques, and even death now looking into our window, two minutes more or less, and glided off the fence and out of sight. I'm gonna read um, two more. This first one has two sections. It's called News, News from the East. My friend sent this pistachio leaf from her yard. I hold it like I would her hand if I could hold it, and turn it in this false light and draw shadows on the table. And I just licked it too, the leaf after the turning, and the dust clings to my throat. I cough and cough, and this one piece of grease inside me is gone. News from the North. My friend has sent a square of sun inside a rectangle of light. Paris is somewhere there inside it. On her hand, the letters of her address, of mine. Dust from the north. I'll taste it too. I'll look for it. <clears throat> I'll look for another trace of her, of her walk down the street. An envelope to enclose simple words, a thought. I was thought of for no more than 60 seconds of writing. Maybe under the sun or in the sun shadowed onto this card in some small room and light illuminated the table, her face, her hand, the way the envelope does my table in the near dark of this room further south. This last one. What I want to look like dancing. A new gift, night rain, the morning suppressed. I keep news in my pocket. Laughter there too. I've just killed 99.9% .9 of the germs on my hands and my fingers could be lavender sprigs. Here, smell them. Let's wait together and see if we can attract bees. My scent and your beauty. We can pollinate our singing and distraction. Sometimes I jump up and down. Sometimes I lilt from foot to foot. Sometimes that looks like dancing. Dancing will look like plants in the breeze. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Curtis. That was amazing. I've never heard you read live, um, and I'm so glad that I could hear you finally. That's wow. Okay. And thank you for mentioning the theme, which I failed to mention actually, which is beginnings. Uh, this is for the audience. I asked the readers to read about beginnings um, because it's the new year, we're in January, we all wanna start over, I know we all do. <laughs> um, so I thought this was a perfect theme. Uh, next we have reading Anne Hood. She is the author of 14 novels, four memoirs, a short story collection, a 10 book series for middle readers and one young adult novel. Her books include The Obituary Writer and Comfort, A Journey Through Grief. Her essays and short stories have appeared in many journals, magazines, and anthologies, including the Paris Review, Plowshares, and Tin House. And she's a regular contributor to the New York Times op-ed page, home economics column. And her most recent work is uh, Kitchen Yarns, 
although I think she has another one coming out. That's from 2019, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, she is a faculty member at the MFA in Creative Writing Program at the New School in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Anne Hood. Thank you, Jennifer, and and thank you for that wonderful reading to the Curtis. That was that was terrific. I know those pledge scented dust rags, and it was really it was really good. So I'm um, taking beginnings in a couple ways. First, I'm going to read from my new book, Fly Girl, which is about my eight years as a TWA flight attendant from 1978 to 1986. Uh, so I started kind of in the golden age of flying, and I ended in well, the age we know now. So um, this is my first reading from the book. So that's one reason it's a beginning, but I'm going to read to you about my the first flight I worked. So that's the other beginning. Um, it is not yet, Fly Girl is not yet out, but it, it's available for pre-order. Oh, I also brought one other visual aid. This was me as a flight attendant. So you can... <laughs> okay. On a cold January morning in 1979, I sat in an auditorium at TWA's Breach Training Academy in the Kansas City suburb of Overland Park with 120 new hire flight attendants. Most of us were women with short or medium length hair, makeup applied with varying degrees of skill, wearing some form of business attire, a phrase that I, as a just turned 22 year old recent college graduate had never even heard before. The smattering of men were all freshly shaven with brand new haircuts and suits and ties. Every one of us smiled nervously and I'm sure like me had pounding hearts. It was our first day of TWA flight attendant training. Look around you, the man on the stage told us. He was the chairman of something, maybe personnel. I was too nervous to take it in. We all looked around the auditorium as instructed. 17,000 people, wanted to be where you're sitting today, he said. By the end of this year, 560 new hires will be in those seats. He paused, one of 17,000 applicants. He paused again, letting it sink in. We were special, we were lucky. We had what it took to be a TWA flight attendant. It's easier to get into Harvard than to sit in your seat, the man said. He broke into a smile. Congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause. All 120 of us clapped and smiled. We'd made it, or so we thought. Over that month at the Breach Training Academy, I learned to success successfully evacuate seven kinds of aircraft, fix a broken coffee maker, deliver a baby, mix proper cocktails, carve a Chateau Brion, administer oxygen, demonstrate safety equipment, and make a baby's rattle out of two plastic cups and a couple of TWA propeller-shaped swizzle sticks. During one test, we had to cor correctly identify liquor miniatures without their labels because the labels peeled off from the melting ice at the liquor carts. To deal with drunk passengers, we role-played by speaking calmly and firmly, even when they grabbed us or tried to steal minis from our liquor cart. We were also taught how to politely brush off passes from male passengers even while we were also taught to perch on the armrests of first class seats when we took their orders. Techniques varied from a flirty, don't be naughty, to what would your wife say? Anything was okay, as long as we said it with a smile. We had just one week of training left before we'd be sent off for a week of working actual flights, then come back to Kansas City to debrief and graduate and get our wings at last. I had completed four years of college, a breeze compared to this four weeks of training and testing at Breach. But just as our wings were in sight, American Airlines Flight 191, a DC-10, flying from O'Hare Airport in Chicago to Los Angeles, crashed on takeoff, killing all 273 people aboard. The news of such a devastating plane crash while in flight attendant training was chilling, but by that time we were already thinking like flight attendants. A flight attendant is not afraid of flying. And no matter how catastrophic a plane crash might be, flying is still safer than driving. Shortly after news of the crash spread, we were called into the auditorium and told our training had just ended. With DC-10s grounded, the airlines that flew L-1011s, like TWA, were in great demand. Our uniforms were hastily assembled. Some people had to wear their own shirts or ties because not all of the uniform pieces had arrived. We would all fly from Kansas City to whatever airport our trial flight left from the next day. 
I couldn't believe my luck. I was working a flight from Boston to LA, a transcontinental one with elaborate service in both coach and first class. I had never been to LA and the naive young woman I was then imagined I would see the Hollywood Walk of Fame and the Hollywood sign and maybe even Laurel Canyon where the singers from my teenage years lived. Our instructors reminded us of the essentials. We always had to have our safety and service manuals on us, easily accessible. These manuals were two doorstops of books filled with everything we needed to know. One with a red cover, safety, the other with a blue cover, service. We jammed them into our uniform purses, our service smock folded up beside them. Those purses were huge with multiple pockets to fit everything we were required to carry and Velcro to close it up so we could access everything easily and quickly in case of an emergency. Makeup, a hairbrush, a regulation flashlight took up most of the other pockets so that we hardly had room for our wallet and passport. Somehow I always managed to squeeze in a paperback, but barely. The cover of the purse had a special place for our employee IDs so that we only had to lift the cover and flash it to sail through security. All of these things were reiterated to us before we left Kansas City, as was a reminder to tip the hotel shuttle driver a dollar. Remember, our instructors told us, you cannot chew gum or smoke cigarettes in uniform. Remember, you must always smile and look approachable. Remember that when you are wearing that uniform, you represent TWA. Have fun. The next day, our class dispersed at MCI, the three letter code for Kansas City. I had an early departure out of Logan Airport that meant I had to spend the night at the Hilton Hotel. I climbed into bed, excited, nervous, terrified, and studied the services on the 1011. In coach, before takeoff, we walked through the aisles renting headsets for the movie and distributing menus with a choice of three entrees. We made sure everyone's seatbelt was fastened, bags were stowed completely underneath the seats in front of them or in the overhead bin, seat backs were forward and tray tables were in their full upright and locked positions. After takeoff, we started with the cocktail service, pushing the heavy beverage carts up and down the aisles as we pulled pop top rings off soda cans, mixed drinks and poured coffee and tea. That service was followed by an appetizer service, skewers of salami, cherry tomatoes and mozzarella balls. Then dinner, a pasta, a beef dish, or a chicken dish. Then a coffee and tea service. Then an after dinner drink service. And finally, TWA pale green mints embossed with the TWA logo and served on the silver tray. And that was just in coach. I poured over my notes. If there are any children on the flight I had written, let them serve the mints, but keep an eye on them. Make sure you have a can opener in your smock pocket. Make sure you have change in your smock pocket for cocktail purchases. Make sure you remember who you owe change to in case you run out. The TWA cocktail napkin is always put on the tray table with the TWA logo at the bottom right. First class service required even more studying. We had to memorize all of the passengers' names and use them when we talked to them. Pre-takeoff, we offered orange juice, champagne, or mimosas passed on a tray. Menus were handed out, opened, and headsets were given for free. As soon as we took off, we offered cocktails that we mixed at a bar set up at the front of the cabin. Rolls had to be warmed, wine opened, salad tossed while standing in the middle of the aisle. And then there was that iconic Chateaubriand that TWA first class was famous for. The aristocrat of roasts, the menu description read, a double tenderloin of beef selected from choice Midwestern steers. Cooked to your liking in TWA's aircraft ovens, and carved at table side from the rolling cart. Remarkably, we actually asked passengers how they wanted it cooked and whoever was working galley had to approximate from rare to well done in our little ovens. The flight attendant working in the cabin carved the meat at the front of first class, a performance every passenger watched. For serving coffee on the airplane, it was required to balance a small tray with cream and sugar and TWA's red propeller shaped stir rods in one hand the coffee pot in the other, TWA logo facing out. How many times had we rehearsed this? Coffee, please put your cup on my tray. The passenger was then supposed to put their coffee cup on our small tray, let us pour the coffee standing in the aisle, then remove the cup and add their cream and sugar. This was to prevent us from spilling hot coffee in anyone's laps by having to lean across a row of passengers while pouring. In training, we'd practiced this over and over, setting up the small tray and walking down the aisle of one of the airplane mock-ups with it in one hand and a coffee pot with the TWA logo in the other. 
In coach, that tray was plastic. In first class, it and the creamer and sugar bowl were heavy sterling silver. That night in my hotel room, all of these rules, how to make a martini, how to carve a Chateaubriand, how to place the cocktail nap, and please put your cup on my tray, mixed with the location of the emergency exits, where the life rafts were stowed, the emergency equipment location, swirled around in my head, keeping me awake. Flight attendants were required to arrive at the airport an hour before their flight's departure time to meet the crew, check the emergency equipment and service supplies on the airplane, set up the services, anything that could be headed, done ahead of time and safely stored during takeoff, and be ready at the boarding door or positioned in the aisles with our uniform jackets, lipstick, and smiles on for the passengers. But afraid to be late, even though the airport Hilton was literally in the airport, I showed up for my first flight much earlier than the required hour before departure. I punched the secret code into the keypad by the gate above crew scheduling. That day, I made my way down the secret steps to the crew lounge at Logan Airport for the first time. Following the airline's trend in hiring top designers like Oleg Cassini and Emilio Pucci, my TWA uniform was designed by Ralph Lauren. The uniform is one of the most important parts of being a flight attendant. Whenever I put mine on, I became a different person, professional, confident, knowledgeable, in charge. But as much as I loved finally wearing my TWA uniform, I was more nervous the day of my first flight than I'd been for any of the interviews or for the, any of the tests I'd taken during four years of college. The crew I was working with was based in Los Angeles, which meant they were all very senior. When we landed in LA, they would all go home and I would make my way alone to the hotel as well as lay over alone overnight. Everything in the airline industry is based on seniority, including when you work and where on the plane you work. Before each flight, crews met in the crew lounge and bid on positions. Basically, the most junior flight attendant worked the position no one else wanted. For example, E-zone on a wide body, which was the all smoking section at the back of a 747. Or on the L-1011, something called GX, which set up all the first class carts, sent all of the carts up the lift, took first class orders, passed warm rolls, served cocktails, poured wine, picked up plates, stacked them in the carts, brought those carts down to the galley, passed more rolls, poured more wine, and then also helped with the service and coach. In other words, GX worked harder than anyone else on the plane. Although later I would meet lots of flight attendants who liked working GX because ironically, they did not want to interact with passengers. For that first flight, it loomed as the scariest position too many things to do, too much organizing, and all of it done on my own. My LA crew was not happy to have a new hire on her first flight working with them. When I introduced myself with an enthusiastic, this is my first flight, they rolled their eyes, sighed, and then pretty much ignored me. When the bidding began, my nervousness made me not listen too closely as the nine senior flight attendants claimed their positions. The next thing I knew, the room had grown quiet and the most senior flight attendant was looking at me. So you're GX, you know how to work GX, right? I wasn't sure I did, but I was terrified that if I admitted I, I was overwhelmed by all the duties GX had, she re would report me and I would be fired. So I smiled and nodded, my head already pounding with all the things I needed to remember. Basically, I did everything wrong on that flight. I had imagined looking pretty, talking to passengers, effortlessly gliding down those beautiful twin aisles offering martinis. Instead, I had trouble opening and setting up the carts, I was forever running up and down the lift because I kept forgetting things below. I forgot the rolls altogether and another flight attendant threw them cold into the basket, growling at my incompetence. I could not keep the names of the wine straight. I couldn't open the champagne bottle and I couldn't remember where anything was stored. Worst of all, I didn't know the secret that I should have two pairs of shoes. The required high heels to be worn whenever we had our blazers on in the airport during boarding and during takeoff and landing and a pair of flats for the rest of the flight for all the hours of standing up and running back and forth up and down the aisle. That spare pair of flats also got jammed into the regulation purse, but I had only high heels for seven hours straight. By about hour four, I was wincing with every step. My feet started to swell at hour five, at which point I took off my shoes and worked the rest of the flight in my stocking feet, something I could surely have been fired for had anyone bothered to notice. When we finally landed, a red-faced, angry flight attendant came marching up from coach to ask me where I'd been the whole flight. I was supposed to help back there, she reminded me. I forgot I admitted, mumbling an apology and trying to move my numb toes, which were now squeezed back into my high heels per our dress code. 
The crew went off to their employee parking lot to retrieve their cars and drive home. I limped through LAX, trying to look like the polished person who belonged in that Ralph Lauren uniform. I retrieved the list of which hotel we stayed in at each city that was carefully folded up in my pocket. I made my way outside and searched for the shuttle to the hotel, the dollar bill they told us to have at the ready for the driver's tip in my pocket. Finally, the van arrived. I got to the hotel, checked in, hobbled to my room and took off my shoes and pantyhose. My uniform stank of smoke. My hair stank of smoke. My hands smelled like all the food and liquor and coke I'd spilled, but I didn't even bother to undress. I fell onto the bed and raised my legs, pressing my swollen sore feet against the wall for relief. Later, I would soak my feet and the rest of my body in a hot bath. I would eat my room service turkey club sandwich with a glass of Chablis, and I would call my parents who were giddy with excitement for me. While I talked to them, I lay down with my legs in the air and my sore feet pressed against the wall again. Tell us everything they said. I was 22 years old, exhausted, and my whole body ached. I had never worked so hard in my life. Like me, my parents had imagined a life of glamor awaiting me. So I told them the only good thing that had happened. I had someone famous on my flight. They were besides themselves. No doubt imagining Al Pacino or Elizabeth Taylor. You know, the guy who played the teacher on room 222, I said, Pete Dixon. There was the slightest pause and my mother said, that old TV show? Right, I said, he was on my flight. In first class, I bet, dad said. No, he was in coach. Well, how about that, dad said. So it was great, mom asked me. So great, I lied, wondering how I was ever gonna put my feet back in those high heels and do it all again in the morning. My alarm went off at five o'clock the next morning and I dragged myself out of bed. I had an 8 a.m. flight, which meant I had to be at the airport at seven, which meant I had to leave the hotel at 6.30, which meant I had to be in the restaurant eating breakfast by six o'clock. I showered and put on my uniform that still smelled of stale smoke, put on my makeup and went downstairs. The lobby and restaurant were empty. The hostess seated me and I ordered coffee and an omelet. While I was eating, a man came over to my table. I'm a TWA flight attendant too, he said. Are you okay? Yeah, why? Well, you're sitting here in your uniform in the middle of the night, he said. No, I'm on the eight o'clock flight, but it's three in the morning, he said. I looked at my watch. No, it's six, I said. On the East Coast, it's three hours earlier here, he told me. Tears came to my eyes and I looked away so he wouldn't see them. It's okay, he said, first flight to LA, first flight anywhere, I said. It gets easier, he said. As soon as he was gone, I paid my check and went back to bed. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, beginnings are rough. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> yeah, that's what that told me. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just, this is for everyone. I've started posting uh, the titles and links to all the faculty's workshops. So, you know, of course you're gonna love their writing because they're all fabulous writers. Definitely check out the links to their workshop and see if you'd like to, to take one. I know Anne is amazing. She's taught with us uh, many times. I'm really glad to finally meet you, Anne, here. Um, yeah, so check out her workshop as well. I'm gonna post that next. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our next reader, who is the amazing Patricia Spears Jones, who is the author of A Lucent Fire New and Selected Poems, as well as three full length collections and five chapbooks. She co edited the groundbreaking anthology Ordinary Women and Anthology of New York City Women, uh, and organized and edited Think Poems for Aretha Franklin's Inauguration Day Hat. She was awarded the Jackson Poetry Prize in 2017, and she's received grants and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, the Malay Colony, Yaddo, and more. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Spears Jones. I'm unmuted. Oh, sorry. Uh, and I, I'm exhausted from, uh, <laughs> from your, oh my God, what, uh, everybody's first day at work is it, wherever it is, is hell. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I saw the beginnings thing and I wasn't quite sure how to respond to it since I rarely write about beginnings, but I do write about different things. And since I know my good friend, uh, Grace Wing Yung Toy, is listening in. 
a few years ago, I wrote um, a chat book called Living in the Love Economy. And here is one of the, the pieces. Facebook profile moment, God in Chinese. Grace changes her profile from cartoon Grace to an ideograph, symbols bold, simple. God in Chinese, she says, it was a difficult weekend. Serenity, power, health, talismans and silk, ivory, gold, or wood. The earth claimed in figures small enough to handle or throw on the floor. I have my ceramic frogs, seashells, a broken plaster angel, each a token of grace found in places far from home. Now they are home. Holding a space in August air, expectant as warriors. Who will they fight? What harm will not befall me? God in Chinese on the computer screen. Life in the waiting storm swirl. Um, so thinking about beginnings, I did begin a poem, which I'm still working on, when I was at BCCA this past summer. And um, since some people from the Midwest are here, I thought I would read this. Fred Hampton, born this day. And it's, it's, it's still a work in progress. Fred Hampton, born this day. On August 30, in a town named Summit, did the weather harbor danger, droughts, floods, tempests across the prairie? Was the hospital close or did the family drive miles to offer up the newborn baby boy? Oh, I should have mentioned this. The fates are here. At least Cloto and Atropos. I'm a big fan of triple goddesses. Okay. Clotho began to spin on August 30th, a black boy who grows strong in body and mind, loving, athletic, disciplined, enraged, engaged with all who were black, black, black in a world type tilted white, white, white on his head, this world where whiteness makes easy the gift of guns and conspiracies for killing anyone Black, 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 and enraged. Was it his black knit peasant cap on top of carefully trimmed Afro or those Marxist Leninist phrases he used at rallies where all were welcome, welcome, where welcome came to all willing to listen, examine, join, then fight of the people for by the people black, for the people, resistors to oppression, resistors to greed that determined the brevity of his days walking earth? Was it the web he was weaving, bringing in whites, Latinos, Native Americans with blacks, a communion of poor, enraged and seeking new ways to open doors to quality housing, economic stability, food and healthcare, a war's quick end? Was it that call for revolution, meaning human rights, meaning the right to stand on a corner and demand just treatment? How could human dignity be such a threat? And yet, Atropos held her sharp knife that cuts the loom's ultimate threads played out in a scene of 90 bullets, government planned rampaged, rampage. One startling December dawn by the conspirators, his pregnant partner awakened and dragged away, saving their only son for future battles. Athropos who never weeps, shook her unruly hair as sign of her immortal distress. Thus, 21 years of living, Fred Hampton's face is the crushed newspaper print where truth departed into snow melt 
gutters and garbage bins, streaked with mud and blood as if he died in a barn. Another creature come to slaughter in Chicago. As City Hall covered its pre-holiday mess with lies that best serve the lackluster liar's jest, power has a way of drifting out of clenched hands. The rest is American history and blood blame and curses, fortunes wheel a proper set up for murderous deeds by credentialed men, each badge dishonored. 21 years, the fates could only allow the virtuous man, more lion than wolf, purr to roar, summer heaters, 30th August, Genesis day at the summit in the middle of America, black boy breathing and squiggling flesh as possibility. Clothos wants to smile, but is not allowed. So last year, the beginning of the year came with a great many uh, losses. And one of them was uh, Lee Brewer, uh, the found, one of the co-founders of Mapping Minds, a great uh, theater director and writer and uh, most energetic man uh, until he wasn't anymore. Uh, the People's Net Club is his eldest daughter. And uh, I came to New York City in 1974 and worked with My Blue Minds. That's how the guy, I got the hell out of the South. Lee Brewer dies, I clean my stove top. Clove calls me at 10 a.m. or so. She lives in California. Her voice is rumbling, sad volume. You should know that Lee is in hospice. I did not know that Lee is in hospice. She says he had time to, she had time to sit and talk to her father. Her brothers had time to sit and talk to their father. What a luxury. A break from distance placed between the living and the dying, those pandemic built walls, but this is cancer. This is organ failure. This is old age, this dying. Thus, the family makes traditional gestures for an unconditional man. His muses, living and dead, mostly, most likely shout him quiet. And the fast talking man is mute. Who sparks your path is always a factor of fortune, good fortune, and light remains lit no matter the brambles. Bad, and all is shadow and stumble and loss. Oh, fortune for me was good, and I cleaned my stove top. The old stove's top has age stains and built boiling over pot stories and memories of landing feet first in the muck of art making. Every memory of pebble, stone, rock of learning, lions die in quiet or in roar. Lions die. That light moves to one more and one more and more pilot light. Yes, pilot light. So, you know that scene in Casablanca where the two guys say this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship? Well, I wrote this poem based on a drawing by Betty Sarr that was in the New York Times. And before it was even published, she contacted me because she'd already seen it and she loved it. And so now I have a relationship with Betty Saul. Not a big one, it's like, you know, but 
Okay. Betty Sars, Mystical Chart for the Unemployed Sorceress. Also, the thing I love about this poem is that I got to use the word runes, R-U-N-E-S, which I've been trying to use for like a thousand years. Finally, I got to use runes. Every poet understands what that means. All right. My runes are in ruins. Little laughter here for my sarcasm. What to do? This chart confuses, conflates moon, which phase and honey, local or from some exotic shore. And what of money, my saving stuff beneath deflating mattress. Each cold day warns me that my resume is unworthy. Who will hire me? Now that my spells are so easily broken, my warnings useless, it is a wonder that I worked as long as I could. Incantations memorized and recipes for spells written in an ink too pale for visibility, each item sourced, the medicine worked, and then it did not. Was it the well of stories drying up? The fish scales thinking the kitchen table? The cat wandering away while spiders spread their cosmic maps unreadable to all but the other spiders? They cheer me. Again, I read the signs. Oh, how the signs obscure true knowledge. And I am blazed in this dark room, hungry, cold, and searching. Who is this thief? And why has she cast this curse. What must I do to bring runes from my parched throat, medicine back to my pockets? Now, not everything I write about is so horrifying and terrible. In 2018, my golden year, I was in the south of France. So, Sunday morning, Cassis, France, August 19, 2018. Morning doves cool. Three small ships in the water. Waves contrail clouds over cliffs. There is no still life. Dynam dynamics of sun, slow rising pink with noise. Time in tides routine, water aggresses, water retreats. Bells shimmer, brass tone. Soon laughter, soon laughter. Clouds mass, clouds retreat. Boats bring in fish sloppy with salt. And I live in Brooklyn. So Ann Hood asked me where, and I said bed -Stuy, so she will appreciate this poem. Morning Glory, Macon Street. And this is written about four years ago. Sunlit even, helicopters hover, skies above Brooklyn, presidential visit, noise in the skies, noise on the ground. You should prune the morning glories, I tell my elderly neighbor, she refuses. She likes the way the vine has curled around her fence with a ferocity that cannot be so easily cut back. I get that. Wildness is rare on a Brooklyn block where old roses return late May as if to say, ha, you think we don't know the season? Squirrels roam the brick backs of tenements and fight with raccoons for the spoils of trash. The huge green leaves of plants with names unknown to me sparkle on mornings bright and tree leaves demand constant sweeping away. The tabby is big and old and tired, too many kittens, not enough food. New cat lovers are not as generous. Neighbors greet each other and shake their heads as the young men and women, mostly white, running, 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 or their heads drowning, drowning, drowning in a pool of light from the mobile, from the mobile 
devices. Ears distance from the here, the now. No crisis of etiquette will take place as the drowning runners see the sidewalk. No hello, all goodbyes. You almost wish they smoked or cursed or had personality, I can hear my neighbors say. Thus, the joy of this morning glory vine, happily taking over. Oh, morning glory, purple, green, leaves fat as Italian cookies, rooted in a garden's disarray. Blossom your hearty display for all to see. Hold your vines haven on Macon Street. Only winter, harsh winter, will take your vines back to the ground, your wildness calmed. And that neighbor is blessed. No, I'm not doing so well. But... Now, I want to thank Wayne Kostenbaum, who posted a line about Roland Bart. Uh, that said Sade, Sade had a phobia of the sea on Instagram, and this is what, ha this is what happened. On Roland Barth's birthday, Sh Sa Sade had a phobia at sea. Who is Sade? Why the phobia? And what of or what is at the sea? Leisurely interrogation, or is this a mockery that bars, as in Roland, write this, or some obscure poet, maybe me? Not I, not today. My French is reckless. I know, I only know of Strade, the Anglo Nigerian singer, and can only listen to two of her songs. The others make me want to weep and slit my throat, and I own a few knives. What a gift, the philosopher's verse, stumbling about the internet like a drunken sailor, slinging phobias at sea, or losing copper coins inside a coat pocket's cheap satin atmosphere. All right, I've been writing a series of poems uh, in the voice of the devil's wife. Here's a couple of them. Uh, and the second one, uh, well, I'll let you know. The devil is beating his wife because she couldn't cook him no rice. I grew up in uh, Arkansas. And uh, so that was one of the, we, you know what? My childhood routines are really nasty. Anyway, here's, here's the devil's wife remembers the good times. He was handsome. He talked to me, to me, to me. He talked to me. He didn't say stupid stuff about my breast or my ass. He asked me, what do you read? I was reading magazines and romance novels and whatever we were supposed to read in high school. Silas Marner. Yes, I read Silas Marner. He was grumpy, I remember, but he had to care for a little girl and that made him better. Do you think a girl can make a man better? Asked the devil. I answered truthfully, I don't know. He smiled. He talked some more. His voice was that soft wind in early spring, the wind that brings earth and grass and blossoming trees, sweet sometimes or funky to the nose. The earth smells human and his voice was that smell. Some call that musk, but it was too floral, to turned soil scent, not animal, but animal would I see when the devil's voice boomed out thunder and shook my heart. And this one is dedicated to the late Greg Tate. The devil's wife explains broken 45s. There was a time James Brown saying, and I want to dance. But that causes the devil to prance upon me, then lash higher his liege around my waist and squeeze me till my voice box almost shatters. You're a doll, he says, as he smashes our turntable, laughing at the clatter ancient 45 RPMs make as they break 
treasures from a lost last century when sweet soul music elevated our scissoring speed. How he hated haloed afros radiant with pride and that slide away from suffering. The devil hates black genius. Made him work harder than hard to render it witless and dope stung. He hates having to move one iota out of his trifling comfort zone. Can't I listen to one piece of my heart untarnished by his guile? Child, soul music is now in limbo and me bruised again, cleaning up those broken 45s. But somewhere on the other side of this sad kingdom, Another woman augurs the audio and James Brown sings out, there was a time. And I'm going to finish with my future poem, which is also in progress, but that's okay. It's my future. So here you go. My future poem. There is no name for what will become what will become, will serve creatures living long after my breath has left. So predictions of perils are as easy to make as predictions of oceanic cities where whales and sharks assemble a congress of fishes wise in the waves, ways of waves. Or lunar worship as the sun's temperature flares ever higher, the moon's phases rest heated hearts, or flight to planets renamed as rage against the ancient Romans, royal scholars, cosmic completions flung across old maps. There be monsters, there be gods, there be goddesses, there be shrines, revels, there be stories new or ancient, there be fears or fascinating each step along the remained Milky Way fraught and necessary. Oh, and there's music in the future, but it's not some lame theremin or electro dance music vibrating at the outpost Mars bar karaoke circa 2075. It is music tracing the best of all there is to sound. This world sweet or jagged, a lotus flower of music. Those tangled roots in murky water, that flower sun lighted as if on stage, the aria opens a chorus of desperate declarations, love, betrayal, vengeance, redemption, a muck of humanity. Within our fears, without our ability to fist and kick and aim a weapon, large or small, as if death of an unlikely enemy is preferable to just talking through that muck. What fucking insanity we must leave behind. And yet, what have we in our dream kit to make possible a future of bold serenity? Bold serenity. Is that what will become left when our bodies dissolve into cosmic dust? Our myths, our experts, the rising seas lashing and earth tired of extraction, quakes ever harsher and we can only hope that with a desire for counsel, music, there will be the taste of peaches. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> you, I'm so glad you read Works in Progress. People don't always do that. I think that was brave and it just shows beginnings are always happening I and mean, it's beginning after beginning. <laughs> <laughs> We're always in progress like that. So thank you. you um, it. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to uh, welcome up our 
final reader. Uh, he's a new faculty member here at 24 Pearl Street, Adrian Matika. He is the author of six books, most recently a mixed media collection inspired by Funkadelic called Standing on the Verge and Maggot Brain, and as well as a collection of poems, uh, Somebody Else Sold the World, very good, I just read it. His book, The Big Smoke, was a finalist for the National Book Award and a uh, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. Adrian was a State Poet Laureate of Indiana in 2018 and currently teaches poetry at Indiana University. Join me in welcoming Adrian Matika. We can't even talk about this. We need to talk about this this wonderful cat that is is all up and down, Jennifer. So, what's the cat's name? What's going on here? She just bit me. <laughs> her name's Polly. Now I'm getting rid of her. <laughs> oh <laughs> no, no. Th thank you for the uh, the feline, um, you know, sort of uh, like interlude. And also, I wanted to make sure and thank you and Naya uh, for. Uh, making this possible. And also my man, Curtis and Anne and Patricia, uh, so many inspirations getting to read with you all. Um, I know that, and also thanks to everybody who's listening. I mean, man, what a series of, of gorgeous writers. So I, I kept thinking about what we were going to do, um, you know, we meaning me and my poems to address something about uh, beginnings. And I, I feel like we've been stuck in the same day for, for about 18 months and trying to understand how to, how to manage both of those was real complicated to me. So I'm, I'm just gonna read from, from this book from Somebody Else Sold the World. And the art on the cover is by this artist named Dario Robletto. And each of these um, silhouettes is a silhouette of an artist. Uh, he, traced off of the cover of one of his grandmother's records and he put them in a, a shadow box. And I was lucky enough to get to borrow his, um, his art from my book. But the book, Somebody Else Sold the World started out as a book of love poems. I got divorced a while back and um, you know, it was the best thing for everybody. <laughs> and it's one of those moments that what do you do with that, right? What do you do when, um, a little while ago, you were trying to figure out who was going to pay the, the cable bill, and now you get to pay it all by yourself. So I, I thought of that as a great new beginning. And so I thought I'd read some of those poems. But then as I was writing the book, COVID happened, and that interrupted my reflections on it. So this is going to be a book about beginnings of, of a new side of things, romance and all the rest of it, and then also uh, beginning to try to understand how to be in the world where something like COVID exists. So the title, Somebody Else Sold the World, came from, uh, was inspired by David Bowie's song, The Man Who Sold the World. And um, so David Bowie pops up in the book quite a bit. All right. I think that's enough explanation for it. I just wanted to read like seven poems or so. Uh, my poems are generally short. <clears throat> On the B side. The song ends because the beginning doesn't jump start again. Red smudge of a mouth, lipstick all over the place like the afterthought a comet leaves on its way out. What makes this moment unfold like a woman raising herself up off of an unfamiliar couch? Honky tonk and the blue honey of an eyeball, perfume in its circus of heart-shaped introductions. Innuendo always stumbles in the lead in like a man pawing around for his busted spectacles after waking up in the world's stubble. Hand over hand he paws through guitar picks and record changers, through busted gut strings and clothing strung in familiar vibrato outside the window. He could be Bowie himself, exhausted by skyscrapers cracked in the aftermath of a smile. His eyes aren't different colors, they just have different focuses. He could be a whole lot of nothing, thin in hair, low change in his right pocket jingling down the stairs. He was given all of it and stole the best of the rest. Even without glasses, he sees her nearly dressed. 3.30 and one third RPM staticky in the lead out's harmony. Right when I started reading that, I realized I should have mentioned a couple of things. It's always good to have a heads up about what's gonna happen. And um, this poem gives a shout out to this episode of the Twilight Zone, where there's a guy who wakes up and he's the only person in the world 
And he's so excited to read all the books in the library and then he breaks his glasses. And I can never remember the name of that episode until somebody tells me and then I remember it and I forget again. And also that David Bowie had two different colored eyes. He didn't, his eyes were the same colors, but he had one eye that pupil was permanently dilated. So it looked like it was a different color. Oh, and also J. Alfred Prufrock's in there too, with his thinning hair walking down the stairs. This is called, um, it was over way back then. And if there was ever a break, uh, 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 aftermath of a breakup poem, I hope that this is it. It was over way back then because of want and tumble, because of word crumbles in the kitchen's halogen. No, separate bedrooms for years and here I am again. Up top in the kitchen light, out front with the burnished stove and the microwave's immaculate readouts. Up here, my cross-cut hands greet the butter knife before the big spread. What I want now is a better ideogram for instead after the skull and crossbones on the pill bottles. What I want is a bucket for my panics and justifications, my coddled addendums down-tagged on the sales table each and every spring. Here we go with that old seasonal bullshit again. Earphones on so your eardrums don't get punched out near the exit. Tom Ford's on too just for the flex of it. Is it too much to ask for quiet after all my losses in this insistent chorus of renew? Is it too much to be momentary in the morning grass? My swig kicks beaten up by the dew. And then about that time, the pandemic happened. And so I wrote a series of poems um, called Somebody Else Sold the World that are in response to the pandemic and the, um, the protests that we had all over the country about violence against Black people and, um, you know, that cornball that was in office before and all of it. So all of that pops up in here. Somebody Else Sold the World. And before I knew it, the violet sky flagged with the, violet, the sun's violent demands, magnolias in bloom, natural light, any place magnanimous without locks or doors. Different kinds of masks for being and breathing. The antagonists with their vanity tans and usual mischiefs whistled jingles about liberties and war as we buttoned up in our confinement and we dreamed about hugging. We talked about was and when when our, we missed our friends and dentist appointments. Molars dropped out without breathable air. Hair forgot its natural colors in the testimonies of intersections and barbecues. Words lost their family recipes. Friends lost their words, then lost their parents. A mass few found love somehow in the gerrymandered grocery lines and farmers fields upturned with unsellable vegetables. So the antagonists cornered the curfews, manufacturing arguments with guns at the ready like henchmen. The air around us was so ripe, it might have broken in half if we could touch it. You know, forgive me because I got <clears throat> a little bit of a frog. I was teaching right before we read. And I got so excited, I burnt my voice out of somebody's poem. You know, I was like, oh my God, this is so good. And it was... You know, now I don't have a voice to read my own poems. This is another Somebody Else Sold the World poem. And um, I should probably say, if this is useful to anybody listening, that I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> you know, the 19th state, the former headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan, you know. And so there's a particular kind of aggressiveness here that goes into um, things related to um, social nets related to people of color, related to marginalized communities. Um, and so during, during COVID, when, like the, the first version when we were all locked down, I watched my very, you know, many of them very racist and, and incoherent neighbors out in the streets with their Trump flags, like actually saw them walking around with that kind of attitude. So this poem is about them and it has an epigraph um, from the Nigerian novelist Ben Cree. Hunger is an antagonist. Somebody else sold the world. Outside, the antagonists are wet with their flag colors and sycophancy, and I'm alone in the front room again, like it's 1982 again, when the power got cut off and the neighbors brawled in sullen countries like the, you know, over the demarcation of kitchen table and China Hutch. Another revolution breaking in half, another slim-ringed alliance snapped under the weight of lost referendums. 
Where did their long stemmed love go? Even now I'm sitting in the window seat in the year of cotton mouth and disaffection as white people goose step masklessly and the antagonists imagine new ways to dismantle poor people. Sitting, running, dreaming, coughing, seeming, cuffs for all of them, bullets too glinting in perpetual velocity. To be poor is to already be blamed for your already busted happenstance. There's no changing that American tradition now, not even during a pandemic. Meanwhile, the antagonists boat out to their islands of isolation and repose. Anything they need is essential, while the rest of us, we stay in place like furniture. Mm. Of course, none of my neighbors like poetry, so they'll never know that they appeared in a poem. <laughs> So I'm just gonna read like maybe uh, like three more. And um, I wanna read this poem that I, I have a different kind of feelings about. I don't know how many of you are in any way interested in Travis Scott, but there was a, he had this poem called, um, like called Highest that was inspiring to me during, during lockdown. And maybe that's useful for me to share too. Um, I wrote almost this entire book from, in it between March and October, 2020. And so what I thought I was writing, this book of breakup and love poems, got transmorgified, you know, um, by the fact that I was stuck here eating tater tots for breakfast and hanging out with my cats, who are also biters, Jennifer. It's a, it's a complicated thing. So this poem is called Highest, um, and it has an epigraph from Travis Scott, I'm the highest in the room. And for whatever reason, that made me laugh all the time during COVID when I needed a smile. Highest. I rise up, therefore I must be like Descartes if he didn't finish all the reading. I raise up like the highest black hand in history class. I am risen like the blood pressure of anybody black mimeographed in this chronic textbook of a monochromatic year. That's infant mortality rate high. That's high top fate high. Almost everything here hangs threadbare, squarely in the red line of summary excuses. Everything else up here from the cop apologies to the solidarity statements, a double tap of somebody else's high side. That's unemployment high. That's Machu Picchu high. What a relief. Hardly anybody struck around to see me on the low side of the mountain. What a reprieve, because I kept it rising stealthily, past my historical anxiety, way past my inherited hearsay, until I am so high up on the shelf I eye level alchemy. Even up here, I'm adept at shrinking myself for safety. Even up here, my shoulders hunch like a small analogy. So I wanted to read like one more kind of um, directly angry <laughs> poem about what we were subjected to from 16 to 20 and continue to be subjected to. I mean, I, of course, I thought that this, would bo this book would be out and we'd be way past what we were dealing with before, right? But instead it came out and I'm reading poems about COVID while we have the highest infection rates since this thing started. The thing that frustrated me so much, and I imagine it's probably true of some of you, is that uh, there was never any culpability in the previous administration about how this stuff would work. There was, it was always being passed from one person to another. And so those excuses built up and I wrote a poem about it. Um, inside the, the, the poem I, I mentioned, Wimpy from um, Popeye. And I also mentioned, um, you know, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock again, um, because that was one of my favorite, it is one of my favorite poems. And then there's other stuff. Somebody else sold the world. I don't know if I should excuses. It's a really good deal excuses. It's not mine even if I could excuses. If I don't, someone else would excuses. If I play along, I'll be excuses. I'm committed to it now, see excuses. Oh no, not me excuses. Excuse me, I'll get you back next Tuesday. Let us go you and I excuses. Excuse me because I loved you too much. Excuse me because I swerved too much. Well, what had happened after it was excuses. Well, I planned to catch a bus after it excuses. It was dark and he was dark, recuse me. There was no one to help me excuses. I was worried about my safety excuses. What about me excuses? Excuse me, what about me? 
I mean, if I can just curse for a minute, man, fuck those folks. They left us hanging out to dry. So I'm just going to read, uh, you know, two more poems. All right. And thank you so much for, um, for listening. I've been thinking a lot about what it means um, to express love and to be tender to people inside of this space that we've all been just trying to survive in, you know? And it brought me back to an experience with the first time I told someone that I loved them and, you know, in, in a romantic way in this one. And, you know, when you say that to somebody, there's only a couple of things that can happen. Either they are like, I love you too, and everybody's happy and it's like a whole scene. Or they, you know, like shift around a little bit, you know, and then start trying to find reasons to go into the kitchen or something, you know, and then you're just sitting there dealing with it. This was a going into the kitchen situation. So just so everybody's clear on what's happening here, but it all worked out in the end. So it's called, I say the thing for the first time. I say the thing for the first time and what comes after? Charcoal under bones, some dark room of soliloquy and irises wide at home, some other glitter party popping off and ending with me counting resignations on the couch with my last pennies. Copper profiles lost in the cushions dull with emancipation and worth almost me. Button nicks instead of eyes, green patina instead of skin over presidential profiles. How to separate, separate the awkward exhales afterward from the full-bodied anxieties. The song in the park across the street bumps something about love and sunflowers, but I can't split my requiem from its simple leather. Sneakers arrhythmically skeletal, squeaking left and right in somebody else's want garden. Midtown, of course, in a cracked city split by a river so cluttered with rough history, it's eye level to the flustered blackbirds. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So the last poem I want to read is, um, <laughs> is I think maybe I'll end with another one, though, somebody else saw the world's poems. I, um, I don't know how many people are going to be there for this, this reference, but the scariest movie I've ever seen in my life was Poltergeist. And this is because I saw it when I was like 11 years old. And this has haunted me and terrified me my whole life. And I saw it on a Tuesday. So I was such a Virgo and, and, and so neurotic when I was a child that I was scared of Tuesday because I watched the movie Poltergeist on Tuesday and it scared me. So I should have known then I was gonna do something that involved patterns like poetry. Um, so this poem, I mean, this is all announced right at the beginning, but I just need to make sure, because Poltergeist was scary. And also, you know, that's before we even get into the colonialism of it and everything else, right? So this is it. Somebody else sold the world. When I was a kid, I watched Poltergeist on a Tuesday and it scared me so much I was afraid of the weekday itself. And still each Tuesday, the long fingered trees outside of my head are missing some bark. Antagonists all over, mostly maskless as unprepared burglars. They cough, <clears throat> like I'm about to, hold on. <clears throat> they cough without covering their tracks. They leave their shoddy fingerprints everywhere. On their self-congratulatory neighborhood walks, they acquit their own nondescript hearts until they burst and resurrect inside the TV's particled white. All voice and hardly any body. It will be weeks before anybody cares enough to change their channel. In my imagination, spring forward, the last antagonist in his fold-out throne feels just like a black man for a minute. Everybody crosses the street as soon as he gets near. His pockets are turned out to their white parts, and still everybody acts like he sold the world. Thanks so much, everybody, and thanks again for including me. I'm grateful. Thank you, Adrian. That was uh, freaky. That was good, <laughs> which is good, which means good. That, whoa. You had to bring us back to that. <laughs> but but actually, that was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm glad you all went with, rolled with the uh, beginnings theme. I like that. Um, something I'm considering next time, I told the, some of the readers, Adrian, you weren't there when we were talking beforehand, but we might do a reading in the round next time. I'm considering this. Yeah, it's fun. It, it keeps everybody on their toes. So it's a different kind of theme. I just, you know, I, all I would say about that is I don't want to read after anybody. Re I just had to read after. 
So if oh. there's a thing like that, what I want to do is be the first reader because I'm not fucking with reading after Patricia or Curtis or Anne. Like I'm not doing that. So if we can yeah. like, ref- like what- change me from being the caboose next time, that would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. That's what they were all saying. Yeah, too. I would say the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it would be fun in a way, I guess on the audience part. That's that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> to see the struggle. Um, yeah, <laughs> the intensity and the, and the papers, <laughs> flipping the yeah. books and like, yeah. yeah. I'm just yeah. grateful for hearing uh, Anne and Curtis for the first time. And I, yeah, we're wonderful. And Adrian, uh, your heart has like a little eyes on it. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's what I get right. Like my, my heart is judging you right now. Right. It's like telling it's you right watching. now that I see you. <laughs> so, I don't even know what brand this is, but it's, I am grateful it's, it's to have just a second well. pair of eyes. Just, you know? Yeah, it's just right. It, it works. It, it was Our, hilarious. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, I'm glad we're all pinned like this. This is nice. I feel like yeah. we're, we're in a little yeah. bit of a snuggle. It's like a little uh, virtual hard. snuggle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to do the, the little send off that I usually do, which is um, I hope you all come back next time when you see that we're going to do a summer program, check out all these writers books. I posted the links. Um, if you didn't catch the links, just go to East End books, type in their name. You'll see their latest books, check out their classes. They're all great teachers. I'm not just saying that they really are. Um, Cause we check around to see like, <laughs> who people like to learn from and, and these are the people so uh mm-hmm. definitely check out their classes and i hope you all keep reading keep writing and keep dreaming and have a great night take care everyone bye-bye thanks, thanks everybody. everybody thank you thank you thank you readers wonderful to read with bye-bye. you bye-bye